Hello, I'm Professor Michael Stein from the Harvard Law School Project on Disability, and I'm delighted to be with you today, even through recording, to discuss a few thoughts about the drafting of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, what we will call the CRPD. I was very fortunate to participate in those negotiations, and so I'd like to talk to you about why we have a treaty, what the impetus for change was, some of the contents of the treaty, and what the prospects are going forward. I hope that this will initiate a dialogue between us and that you will feel free to contact me by email or through other media and that we at HPOD can be of use to you going forward. Following World War II with the creation of the United Nations, until the time that this treaty was negotiated and is the first human rights treaty of the 21st century, there were seven core legally enforceable UN treaties. None of them, however, with the exception of Article 23 in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, mentioned people with disabilities. In addition, when people with disabilities were mentioned in these treaties, as in the CRC, their participation was always contingent to the extent that was feasible. So children with disabilities are to be included in school and in programming under the CRC, but only to the extent that's possible. Those of us with disabilities and those of us who advocate on behalf of individuals with disabilities found this rather lacking. People with disabilities, just like all people, are human and should be included in the human rights system. In fact, in 1993, a special rapporteur named Leandro Despuey from Argentina issued a report and looked at the UN system and concluded that unless there was a special treaty targeted towards people with disabilities, Human rights violations will continue and people with disabilities will not be part of the larger UN system. He backed up that recommendation by pointing out that for the decade prior to his report, there had been a total of 17 complaints relating to people with disabilities throughout the entire UN system, and 13 of those had been declared inadmissible. In addition, people with disabilities were excluded from general UN programming. A very prominent example is the Millennium Development Goals. That has been the largest program issued by the UN. The idea behind the MDGs was to have world poverty by the year 2015. And yet people with disabilities in the eight goals, 60 indicators, 21 targets, and 60 indicators are only mentioned once in the case of women who give birth in less than sanitary conditions becoming disabled afterwards and yet the MDGs relate to people with disabilities. We knew at the time of trying to go forward with the negotiations of this treaty, we said then that there were 650 million persons with disabilities around the world. Now the World Bank and the WHO have declared that there are nearly one billion people with disabilities around the world. And yet, people with disabilities accounted for nearly 20% of those living below the poverty line, but no word of them in the MDGs. Children with disabilities were said to account for one-third of the primary school-age children not in school, and the MDGs were intended to ensure that all children of primary school age were in school, and yet no mention of people with disabilities. So there was a great push to try to have people with disabilities be part of the UN system. There was also, in addition, a very thoughtful and thorough report written by Professors Gerard Quinn and Teresia Degener under the auspices of the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights that looked at the UN system and piece by piece evaluated the way that people with disabilities were not included in systemic programming, ought to be included in systemic programming, and that a special UN treaty was necessary in order to get us over the hump towards that goal. There were movements in the mid-80s, specifically by Sweden and Italy, to encourage the General Assembly to have a specific UN Disability Treaty, and yet the UN General Assembly felt that they were treaty fatigued, treated out. They were working on the rights of children, the rights of women, the rights of migrants, all of which were enormously important, but they didn't feel they could take on another specific UN Treaty. The government of Mexico, however, under the leadership of Vincente Fox, really gave the political impetus for the UN to think about a disability-specific treaty. And actually, if we track the negotiations of the treaty from the time that the General Assembly approved a committee to consider whether there ought to be a treaty, which was in 2000, to the time that the treaty was finally adopted by general consensus, December 13, 2006, we see the arc of the Vincente Fox government in Mexico.
and the Mexican government, along with many other developing countries, were very much in favor of and supported the negotiation of this treaty. And so our story begins in 2001 with the General Assembly approving a committee to go forward and consider whether there ought to be a specific disability treaty. And there was some tension at that time. Should a treaty be one that looked at development rights, meaning economic social rights, positive obligations? Or should it be something that looked at non-discrimination, as in negative rights, thou shalt not discriminate against people with disabilities? Or should it be some mixture of the two, as in the CRC, or as in other sorts of human rights treaties? There were eight full ad hoc sessions that went to the negotiation and consideration of these treaties. During the first two ad hoc sessions, each of which took two weeks, each of which was held in New York, that was where the, all the state's representatives who met and the DPOs, we will talk about the non-governmental organizations representing people with disabilities over and over again, because it was people with disabilities who themselves drove this process and enabled the negotiations of these treaties. But the first two sessions really were deciding whether there should be a UN treaty specifically for people with disabilities, and if so, what type of treaty it should be. The EU very prominently supported the notion of a non-discrimination treaty. Many developing countries, including China and many from Africa, supported the idea of a development treaty, and all in the end concurred that there ought to be a holistic treaty, one that both included civil and political rights on the one hand, and economic, social, cultural rights on the other hand, working together in the way that the Vienna Conference described as interrelated, interdependent, and, and holistic as far as including people with disabilities in every aspect of society. The only government that prominently resisted the negotiation of a disability-specific treaty through the first two ad hoc sessions, I'm very sorry to say, was the United States government. After the two first ad hoc sessions, there was a working group which included states' representatives, NGOs, prominently people with disabilities, and a few academics that came out with draft treaty articles. And from the third ad hoc session through the eighth ad hoc session, what we had were both formal negotiations and informal negotiations. But let's back up a minute and talk about the role of people with disabilities. Until this CRPD was negotiated, the UN treaty had never included the targeted stakeholders as representatives. That's not to say that women were not present during the CEDO negotiations, they surely were. And that's not to say that children weren't present during the CRC negotiations, they were as well. But the idea of the representative of the targeted group sitting there as NGOs, sitting there as DPOs in our case, and negotiating in the process, that is a first for this UN treaty. And it was motivated by the theme of nothing about us without us the goal of the International Disability Rights Movement that no one should talk about people with disabilities without including people with disabilities. Their input, their wisdom, their lived experiences, so as to come out with the best possible results. This was also enabled by the first ad hoc chair, who is Ambassador Luis Gallegos of Ecuador, who said, well, if we're going to consider whether there should be a disability treaty, we ought to hear from the targeted group as to what their lives are like, why they feel there ought or ought not to be a treaty, and what they think a treaty ought to include. And so almost by accident, but also by force of will and by the grace of Ambassador Gallegos, people with disabilities were included from the beginning. If we look at the first ad hoc session, we see that 85 people with disabilities were registered to participate in the negotiations, and if we flash forward to the end of the eighth ad hoc session, which was the last substantive negotiation, there was a ninth ad hoc session in which the treaty text was rubber stamped, we see 850 by the end of the eighth ad hoc session. That's quite an increase. And the idea of people with disabilities being part of the negotiations from the beginning was encouraged and supported by Secretary General Kofi Annan, supported and encouraged by the second ad hoc chair, Ambassador Don McKay of New Zealand, and it became expected that people with disabilities would be part and parcel of the negotiations. Now this happened on two different levels. There was a formal level, so from the third ad hoc session through the eighth, the text of the treaty was cycled through during each of these two-week negotiation sessions, 
And at the end of every session, the UN works from 10 to 1 and from 3 to 6. At the end of each of these daily sessions, a representative from the International Disability Caucus, the IDC, would speak on behalf of people with disabilities, speak with one voice, and say what it was that the international disability community thought about particular provisions. There was also the educative function of people with disabilities speaking during these ad hoc sessions about what their lives were like. And these ranged from very poignant, very moving discussions of what it was like to have been in an institution or a psychiatric hospital, what it was like to have seen people who never left the psychiatric institutions and spent their lives imprisoned indoors, to more lighthearted but very pointed discussions. I think my favorite was that by Robert Martin of New Zealand, someone who has an intellectual disability and who comes from a very progressive country, who talked about what it was like not to have been able to own a bank account and to be able to handle his own finances until he was well into adulthood. And he sort of scratched his head and he said, you know, I don't understand because I'm sitting here in the United States and there's this company called Enron that's lost $3 billion. None of them have intellectual disabilities. And yet, I've never written a bad check in my life. I've never lost money. Why is it that because I had an intellectual disability, it was assumed that I couldn't handle my finances? But here you have people without intellectual disabilities, with advanced degrees, losing billions of dollars, and that's considered just fine. This was a very important function. Most of these states' representatives, although they were very open to the idea of a disability treaty, come from elite and privileged backgrounds, often come from countries where people with disabilities are not visible. They're not seen on the streets, they're not seen as part of society, and the idea that on an everyday basis during these negotiations, the state representatives interacted with people with disabilities, saw them, communicated with them, had to interact with them, received briefing notes from them, were lobbied by them for different provisions, were educated by them as to the disability community's positions on various provisions. This was enormously useful, and it's reflected in the ultimate text of the document. In fact, if we were to look at Article 4, we would see that there is a general obligation on behalf of states to actively consult with and interact and heed the advice of their civil society groups, and in particular, those with disabilities. We see in the monitoring provisions that states' representatives and states' parties must interact with, seek the advice, and utilize and cooperate with DPOs, disabled people's organizations, at the local level. This idea of nothing about us without us, of disabled persons being able to speak to what their lived experiences are like, what their priorities are, what their needs are, permeates the convention and permeates its implementation. And so that was enormously important. From the third ad hoc session through the eighth ad hoc session, there were these formal negotiations. The UN itself at that time was not accessible to those with physical, sensory, or other disabilities. Something that current Secretary General Ban Ki-moon promised to change and has in fact changed. The UN is now accessible to people with disabilities. But at that point, the formal text was put up on large screens behind the dais. If you happen to have a print disability or a visual disability, you could not access those documents. There were no alternative formats released to those with disabilities or those who were older and needed large print. The daily summaries, which tell people what happened during the negotiations during the day, had to be put into accessible formats by various NGOs and DPOs acting on a pro bono basis. The room itself was not accessible to those with disabilities. If you happen to be hearing impaired or deaf or hard of hearing, you would sit on the side and bring your own interpreters, maybe even share them if possible. If you had a mobility impairment, you sat at the back of the room. At that point within the UN, by the way, there were two toilets that were accessible to those with disabilities. And as I said, by the end of the negotiations, there were 850 of us registered to attend. So you can understand now why we all get to know each other very well. So during these formal negotiations from 3 through 8, the text of, of the, of the uh, treaty is put up on these inaccessible screens. The IDC, the International Disability Caucus, would meet before the negotiations from 8 to 10. They would work out what the view of the IDC was. Often there were various and conflicting views among the disability community. But at the end of the day, one view 
one voice, one vision was presented, and that was presented at the end of these ad hoc sessions. That was the formal negotiations. The informal negotiations, as often happens either at the UN or in any large corporate setting, was behind the scenes, outside in the coffee shop, out in the embassies, at bars, at restaurants. People with disabilities would find like-minded or perhaps very unlike-minded states' representatives and try to pull together coalitions, try to work out what are the objections that states have to various provisions. How can we move them to see our point of view? How can we share in, in this understanding? Where can we reach mutual compromise? And from the eighth through the from the third through the eighth ad hoc session, that is how the treaty was negotiated. By the time of the eighth ad hoc session, there were numerous informals, as they're called, meaning embassies and state councils would host people with disabilities and various states' representatives, and they would work out texts of various articles that come together. Over the period of the negotiations, and you can see this by going to the UN Enable site and looking at all the documents that are housed there and archived, you can see that the articles transformed themselves over the several year period. Many provisions were released, others were developed. There was a give and take. At the end of the day, no one was completely happy that their position was included, but yet at the end of the day, everyone was happy in that the treaty was adopted by general consensus by all the UN states representatives who were there and was endorsed by the, dis by the disability rights community globally and by others. And so we had a treaty. What are some of the interesting provisions within this UN treaty? There are many and numerous. One thing that we should look at just globally is that the treaty in many ways tries to map out what the Convention on the Rights of the Child did, meaning that it looked at existing UN treaties, it looked at existing human rights. The argument and the party line from the disability community is that no new rights are included in this treaty, that everything has a lineage or a heritage within the UN system, and if we look at the beginning of the preamble, we can see how various provisions are cited to as being the origin for parts of the treaty. However, it is also like the CRC, a holistic treaty. It combines civil and political with economic social rights. It tries to explain within the context of disability what these specific rights mean. And so we see a variety of rights. We see rights that look very obvious and clear and, and redound from parts of the UN system, the right to employment, the right to political participation, the right to education, the right to a standard of living. All these have very clear precedents within the UN system. We also see some rights that it's very clear are very specific to people with disabilities, but that enable other sorts of provisions and rights. For example, the right to habilitation and rehabilitation are very clearly linked to the right to employment and the right to education. Then there are rights which clearly we could make arguments about coming from other parts of the UN system, but those arguments seem a little less strong than others. So for example, the right to independent living or the right to personal mobility. Clearly these are necessary for the full enjoyment of human rights by people with disabilities, but it is rather hard or harder, we should say, to try to trace back to specific pre-existing human rights treaties and see a clear lineage there. The treaty has a preamble, and it's interesting to go through it because, number one, it has um, many of the provisions that didn't quite make it into other parts of the treaty. So, for example, at one point there was the talk of a separate article for indigenous persons, and the groups representing indigenous persons, quite frankly, ran out of support after the third ad hoc session, and that proposal didn't get very far. But we see indigenous persons mentioned in the preamble. Sadly, we don't see indigenous persons mentioned under the right to education and the right to learn within your own cultural language. We don't see indigenous persons mentioned when we think about property and other sorts of rights that people who come from native cultures have slightly different perspectives and perhaps different rights base than others. We also see within the preamble the words areas of foreign occupation. At one point that was part of the article to situations of risk. But due to advocacy by several states, including the U.S., the words areas of occupation was removed from the specific article on situations of risk and placed within the preamble. 
The roles of families, and here again, there's a very different cultural understanding between the North developed Western, if you like, DPOs and states, and those who are from developing Southern, uh, less developed states or, develop, or in transition states. The idea of what families should do and the roles that families have and the rights that family members and other supporters have within this treaty were severely toned down and are mentioned more in the preamble than they are in specific articles later on. And again, this is a very distinct cultural gap and a very dysfunction between what certain parts of the world think and what other parts of the world think. At the same time, there is also different cultural understandings about the right to independent living. Linguistically, it was misunderstood by certain states' representatives that independent living meant living on one's own as opposed to being able to decide one's own choices within the day, what to eat, where to live, who to live with. Here again, there are different cultural understandings. What's prominent within the preamble and within Article 1, which is entitled Purpose, is the social model of disability. The idea that disability is not a medical construct, it's not pathological, it is not an inherent or biological loss or failure on behalf of people with disabilities, but that in interaction with the way that we create our societies, people's impairments can create the situation that we call disability. So it's not the fact that I happen to use a wheelchair that keeps me out of a courthouse that doesn't have an elevator, it's the fact that we built a public building with stairs that doesn't allow everyone from the public to be involved. This social model of disability, which was a great driver of the international disability rights movement since the 1970s, appears in the preamble and appears in the purpose article, number one. It's the only core human rights treaty that has an article that has the title purpose, because the idea is you cannot reserve against the purpose of a treaty. And if the purpose of the treaty includes the social model of disability, we have to be aware of the social model of disability at all times. Article 2 of the treaty, which has technical definitions, does not include a specific definition of disability. We see a floor definition within the purpose section and within the social model of disability, but not within Article 2 definitions. We do note that the definition of disability discrimination includes the denial of a reasonable accommodation, something that is taken both from the American and the European context, and that the definition of disability discrimination is anything that prevents, a, that prevents someone from enjoying their full human rights on the basis of disability. Because it's on the basis of disability, not only does it include violations to people with disabilities themselves, but it also includes those who are associated with people with disabilities their families, friends, and supporters. And that is again, although technically included in the American definition, much more prominent within the European and other forms of disability discrimination. Other things that are prominent within this treaty include uh, an awareness of women and children with disabilities, and so there are separate articles that highlight that we must always attend to their increased vulnerability and must always ensure their full participation within society. An awareness raising provision in Article 8, states have to break down stereotypes and stigma and also affirmatively work to make positive imagery about people with disabilities within their countries. The rest of the provisions are of course all notable, but we should note Articles 12 through 17, the range on legal capacity, prevention of torture, and bodily integrity. For many years, people with disabilities were subjected to torture and inhuman and degrading treatment, and large NGOs like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International would enter psychiatric institutions, enter institutions generally, pass by the people with disabilities, but report on political prisoners and others. It was right for them to report on political prisoners and others, but wrong for them to ignore the situation of people with disabilities. These articles go to that issue. They also go to the issue of guardianship, whereby people with disabilities are just have their legal capacity, the right to decide who to live with, how to live, where to live, the right to enter into contracts to dispose of property, the right to own bank accounts, and so on and so forth, the right to vote, just taken away from them without any sort of uh, due process other than a pro forma situation where they're placed under guardianship. Blackstone once wrote in the 
18th century that the situation of women upon marriage was that they died a legal death. And the same has been true for people with disabilities around the world. When one turns 18 or 21, it's presumed if you don't have a disability that you can make your own choices. But in most or many of the countries around the world, it's presumed just the opposite, that people with disabilities cannot make those choices and have to have those choices made on their behalf. Articles 12 on legal capacity, Article 13 on access to justice, reverse that and bring us back to a status quo in which people with disabilities are assumed to have legal capacity and to be able to make their own decisions and their autonomy and their wishes must be respected. In fact, states are affirmatively required to provide facilitation so people with disabilities can make those choices. These are very significant articles. We should also note that the right to education is not only for children with disabilities, but for people with disabilities throughout their entire lifetimes. The right to political participation, to participate in culture and sports activities is recognized the right to standards of living, and so on and so forth. If we were to take the whole bundle of the CRPD and classify it within one sentence, we would look to what NFB, National Federation of the Blind, and political scientist Jacobus Tenbrook refer to as the right to live in the world. The right to participate just like everyone else in their communities, in their societies, in their own decision making, the right as a person with a disability to be just as good and just as included as those without disabilities. And that's what this convention is about. And that's why the role of people with disabilities to participate in decision making, in helping governments to understand what their priorities are, to point out what programming is discriminatory and exclusionary, to point out how things can be made better for them is so crucial and so important to this entire convention. The convention was adopted by consensus at the United Nations on December 13, 2006. We were very honored to have two prominent members of the International Disability Caucus speak from the floor of the General Assembly, which by the way was not accessible to people with disabilities, and to talk about how important the convention was to them. The CRPD opened for signatures in March of 2007. It was signed by more states, parties than any other human rights treaty on its first day. It has subsequently been ratified by 127 states, parties, and counting. Uh, the U.S. came close to ratifying it. I'm sorry to say we did not, but hopefully one day we will. And the U.N. Convention is up and operational. The entire U.N. system has created an interagency task force. We see disability point persons appointed in places like DESA, UNICEF, the UN High Commissioner's Office, UN Office for Refugees and, and Internally Displaced Persons, and they are interacting to ensure that in the future and as soon as possible, people with disabilities are included in all aspects of programming. They are mainstreamed as well as targeted. What we have also seen is that the Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities, the treaty monitoring body charged with enforcing and implementing this treaty to the extent that any UN body can do so is up and running to its fullest. It is receiving states reports, it is receiving complaints from people with disabilities and from uh, NGOs and others on behalf of people with disabilities, it is issuing recommendations, and it is being very progressive in its thinking about what this treaty means. Well, what are some of the better prospects for change across the world? What we're seeing is law reform to begin with. And as a lawyer and a law professor, I'm very proud of that and I've been very fortunate to have been involved in it in many countries. Countries that never thought about what to do about its largest minority group, about people with disabilities, are now writing systemic national disability laws and including people with disabilities in their programming. That has been a dramatic change. We are seeing an expressive effect around the world as well. We are seeing people with disabilities coming together and organizing at the local level, whereas before they were often told that they weren't quite human, they weren't entitled to rights. If they were entitled to rights, they were special rights and not full and inclusive rights. They're coming together and speaking to their representatives and to their governments about being full members of society and demanding that their lives be acknowledged and their rights be included. That's been a wonderful process of change. And we see it at the local level as well. We see people with disabilities, for example, 
uh, a group of university students with disabilities that we did a training with in Korea, who said to us, well, you know, um, we're not quite as, as functional and we're not as productive as normal people, their words, not mine. And we pointed to the treaty and we pointed to Korea having ratified it and having been very involved in its ratification and its development. And these university students who are, by the way, among the leading advocates within their country said, well, our government has acknowledged that we're as good as everyone else. I'm going to tell my teachers, my doctors, my family, my social workers, and anyone around us that we're as good as everyone else. That's what this treaty has also enabled. Finally, and perhaps most immediately, we're seeing a sea change in development. Most of the many billions of dollars every year that are spent on development, building dams, creating courthouses, having employment programs, having HIV and AIDS awareness, have not included people with disabilities. And again, the Millennium Development Goals are the primary example of that. This treaty through Article 33 requires that people with disabilities in all international development be included equally, that all development aid be inclusive. The EU, which is the world's largest development donor, committed to inclusive developing during the negotiations. And so what we are beginning to see are guidelines that are being developed, programming that is being developed, that keeps people with disabilities at the forefront of this programming, rather than as the window dressing or the add-on or the special mix later on in programming. And what we're seeing are the many hundreds of billions of dollars a year that are being spent around the world. We're starting to see, not fast enough for our purposes, but we're starting to see them include people with disabilities. And that's having a real life effect and an immediate effect on people with disabilities. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to those of you in the field, those of you who are working every day, whether you're people with disabilities, family members of persons with disabilities, academics or advocates on behalf of the rights with disabilities, who are doing the work every day and making change. And we are seeing change. I've been very fortunate to have worked in some three dozen countries on different projects relating to people with disabilities. And quite frankly, the hardest part of my work is leaving the country and telling people that it will take time for change. It makes me feel terrible because I know that I go home and despite the shortcomings I see in American disability law and policy, I understand that I am very privileged and that those who remain behind, those who are in country, in developing countries, are going to struggle and are going to bang their heads and are going to shed tears. And I tell them that ultimately their tears will become tears of joy. And I believe that, but it will take time. And so I encourage you to continue with your advocacy. You are the disability rights champions. You are the ones at the forefront of changing society. I do believe we will see change within our lifetime. I thank you again for having me with you through this recording. I encourage you to reach out and connect with us here at HPOD electronically and through other media. I wish you luck and perseverance and strength in your advocacy activities. Thank you again.